my call sign is Sonic. I have a call sign because for the last 16 years, I have been part of a high-performing elite military team called the United States Air Force. I'm also part of a high-performing company team called Afterburner. Yeah, I grew up in Michigan, and my grandfather used to fly B-24s in World War II. And I remember being a really little kid, and he would sit me on his lap, and he would go through airplane books, and he would go, is that a B-17 or a B-24? And I loved these big planes with their massive propellers, and he never said to me something like, girls couldn't do it. He never, I, I thought all women flew in World War II. And then when he passed away, he left me $500 and told me to use it for um, aviation camp and to get a lesson. And so I took that $500 and I went to aviation camp, loved it, won their little Top Gun award, really cheesy, but I still kept it to this day. I was 15 or something like that. Um, but my husband went to it too and he didn't get that award. So we have a little friendly competition in the house. So it's down in Huntsville where they do space camp. They also do the aviation camp. So you spend a week and you wear a little flight suit and you get to put together a mission and you pretend kind of like you're playing military and I loved it. And then I heard, oh, you can do this more. You can go to the Air Force Academy. So I was hooked and I really wanted to go, wanted to get a pilot slot. And at that time, it was really hard to get a pilot slot. So I wasn't even sure if I, if I would. And my backup was try maybe be an engineer. I ended up being an English major uh, because engineering was really hard. <laughs> so I went with something that I loved and that was the humanities. And then turns out you can be anything and still be a pilot. You can study as long as your grades are good enough. So fell in love with Colorado and the mountains and flying and made it a career. So we were now what's called committed. We knew that we were going into the military, but none of us had ever seen war, not known anything about it. And so I was at the academy the morning of 9-11. I was eating breakfast in our big chow hall in Mitch's, and we heard someone over the radio say, someone just ran their plane into a tower. And all of us were thinking, it must have been some poor pilot that just got lost. And I kept eating. And then I walked into my classroom, and as we walked into our classroom, we all watched that second tower fall. We all looked at each other, and I'm getting chills just thinking about it. We all looked each other in the eye and knew, holy crap, now we're going to war. We're all committed. And so there was kind of this sense of panic of, we're the first generation that is now going to be committed to war. And then also while that's happening, the whole academy went on lockdown and we all had to go and, and hide. And one by one, they were pulling out my classmates to let them know that their parents hadn't survived at the Pentagon and they were walking away to give them that news. And so for us knowing that now we're going into war, it changed the last two years. Everything that we did, every fight for that pilot slot, we were like, man, we're, we're gonna be deployed. This is, this is the real thing. And the reason why I actually have more respect for the young kids now we joined the academy not knowing that this was going to happen. But this generation that is now coming into the military, they know war. That's all they've ever known. They're the true heroes, the people who are signing up and they already know what they're walking into. You know, I kind of fell into it. And so I would say to the, to the young people that have signed up, thank you. Thank you for, for carrying the torch for us. So I applied for this program called the White House Fellows Program and while I was sitting out in the lobby I saw a bunch of other people and they said they were military. Pilots just somehow congregate to other pilots. We're sitting around kind of joking and one of the guys says, yeah, you know, I, I work for this company called Afterburner and they're always looking for good speakers and I thought I teach public speaking. That sounds kind of interesting but I kind of filed it in the back of my mind. And then I kept hearing a few other people mention it and say, no, really, you can take the things you learned from aviation and you can help people in the business world accelerate their performance. And that really seemed like meaningful work to do as you're transitioning from the military to business. You don't have to let go of these things that we've poured our hearts into. And we get to share it and help people in their business. So I looked up the guy that I had met at the other program and just said, hey, do you think they'd be interested at all? And then about two weeks later, Afterburner put out a, a call on Facebook and just said, anyone interested, come to these auditions. So through all caution of the wind, came out to the audition and got to know this team of incredible people. You walk into headquarters and it feels like being in a squadron. So it felt like home. And I'm here today to talk to you about one thing and one thing only, and that is called flawless execution. And that's flawless execution in a rapidly changing, challenging, and because our team is full of Navy SEALs and elite performers and fighter pilots, sometimes hostile environments. Does anyone in this room know about working in challenging or changing environments? Yes? Okay, I think that's why they brought me in. 
What I think I see the best in Flawless Execution is the concept of I have a very specific mission objective, but there are going to be challenges. Nothing's easy, so you have to identify what those threats are and then find the right resources to mitigate those. See, my mission objective in Afghanistan was to come in and look for the Taliban at night in my airplane. During the day, I volunteered to teach English. And I was also supposed to teach them how to vote, how to get ready for their first democratic national election. But when I walked into that room, even though my mission objective was to teach them, they wanted nothing to do with me because we have about a thousand years of cultural barriers between us. Number one, I walk in and I have a pistol. That's a holster. I have a pistol on my hip, an M9. It's not the friendliest way to walk into a room. Okay. Number two, I'm a woman and there are a few barriers between us for men and women in, the, in that culture. Number three, <laughs> I'm a pilot in a, in a flight suit. They know darn well what I'm doing at night. So I have to think about the threats to reaching my mission objective and I have to come up with resources. I'm trying everything. I'm trying jokes, nothing. I'm trying to be nice and build relationships, nothing. So finally I asked their class leader, Saeed, one day. I said, Saeed, man, what is it? What do you guys love more than anything? He says, we love music. You do? So I pick a song and I choose it in Dari. I don't know what I'm singing. It just had a really easy chorus. The chorus went la 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 la. And I thought, okay, anyone can sing that in any language. So I come in the next day, no joke, you can get a guitar on Amazon delivered to a war zone. And so I get this guitar, <laughs> yep, I bring it in, and I see them kind of looking, like what is this crazy American lady gonna do? I sit there and start strumming and singing in Dari, singing my heart out, not knowing what I'm singing, and they're going la 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 they start picking up their heads and they're smiling and they're laughing and they're looking at me and I think I'm breaking through. One of them says, Miss, do you know what you're singing? I said, uh, no. And he said, it's a love song to a man, a man to a woman about how she smells like roses. And they find this to just be hilarious and now we become friends. And one day when they were supposed to go vote, they left the classroom, they went to their villages and they vote and they dip their fingers in blue ink. That's the way they vote. They came back to class later and they showed me their hands with so much pride and they said, look, we learned, we, we voted and we were so proud. That night, I am not kidding you, when I got my mission, it was to take my airplane and fly over a convoy that was carrying ballot boxes from the villages to Kabul, the capital, to get counted. My job was to protect their democracy. I'm going to break this down for you, but it's plan, brief, execute, debrief. Plan, brief, execute is where most businesses stop. And what I'm here to say is I'm challenging you to think about plan, brief, execute, and debrief. I think the concept of having people identify and even say out loud, this is my mission objective. It gets your whole team to buy into it as well. And then once you're all on the same page, then you can go, okay, what is the main thing that is gonna keep us in my business, in my family, from achieving that mission objective? What's the biggest dragon towards the boat? What's the threat? Okay, just because the threat's there doesn't mean we give up. We find the right way to overcome that. You know how you hear the phrase, never forget? I would say honestly, there, there's still a conflict going on, there's still a war, there's still people we're losing every day. And a lot of us have these bracelets, but you know, we lost an air crew and it was in 2013 and we wear it to never forget because there's still people, well, we have the luxury of being in America and being free that are still deployed. And I would just ask that people don't forget that America's still out there.